You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, stocktwits.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the optionsinsider.com. The Options Insider Radio Network is sponsored by Fidelity Investments. At Fidelity, you always get a great value for your options trades. And with powerful investing tools that provide clear next steps, plus independent research and a wide range of investment types, we can help you make better trading decisions. Learn more about options trading with Fidelity at fidelity.com backslash options. Options trading entails significant risk and is not appropriate for all investors. Certain complex option strategies carry additional risk. Before trading options, contact Fidelity Investments by calling 800-544-5115 to receive a copy of the characteristics and risks of standardized options. Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC, member NYSC SIPC. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market. From unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block. With your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group. And co-hosts, Uncle Mike Tussaud from RCM Asset Management. Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi from OptionFit.com, and Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionFit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody. That music means it's time to rock out with the option block everyone's favorite at least it's mine hopefully it is yours as well thanks for joining us here noon central 1 p.m eastern on the old live link or via wherever you get your favorite podcast programs we don't judge just hit us up questions comments insights pearls of wisdom play along with our polls all that other fun stuff that you guys like to do we like to keep it coming for you We've been hitting you up hopefully you've enjoyed the explosion of content that's been hitting you here in the new year you guys like it. We're hitting you up with it, including new shows like the Crypto Rundown, a new one recording later today. Maybe we'll even stream it live for you, too, a little bit later because we have a lot of international flavor and flair to that program. It's going to be a little bit later. It's going to be 4 Central, 5 East. That's probably going to be the regular recording time. So it's a crazy time, I know. So if you can't join us live, I understand. But make sure you get the podcast available wherever you have been. And people have been hitting us up already. So clearly a lot of you have been checking that one out. Hopefully you like it. Seems like a lot of you do. Speaking of a lot of people, let's see who we got Joining me, if it's a lot or a few, we shall see. Let's spin the old dial, see who we got on the old program today. Let's start off. Let's go out to that land, that sleepy hamlet known as St. Charles, where we are joined by none other than the stalwart of the option block program, the yin to my yang, Mr. Uncle Mike Tusa from St. Charles Wealth Management. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the program. And how's your voice? I know you've been you've been doing a lot of strategery lately. Are you are you just completely exhausted from it, sir? No exhaustion. When something exciting is the strategy block, how can I possibly be exhausted? Naturalized adrenaline. <laughs> I like that. Natural maybe we'll change the name of your segment to the Naturalized Adrenaline Show, also featuring options. Starring Uncle Mike Tusa. I like that. A little bit long. We can workshop it, but it has some promise. I like it. And then we're also going to spin the wheel. Let's see where we land. Oh, who knows? Who knows where we are whenever we are joined by the greasiest of meatballs, Mr. Mark Sebastian. Mr. Meatball, welcome back to the program. Have you recovered from the big option pit palooza last week? You know, I have. It was, uh, that was a good time. Uh, that was a good time on uh, Thursday night, was it not? Yes, it was. Uh, you know, we got some good pasta. We had some. Some nice wine. We uh, ate. You got your 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 option pit steak again. 
Which yes. made you happy. And even a chicken to boot, so it was a good and combo. Some chicken, and and e- some chicken and scallops. And even, at, nice little- even at your own event, which is a hardcore options event, people were hitting me up about the crypto show. People are clearly uh, down the rabbit hole for all things crypto, which is good. That means people are listening. And hopefully you keep listening right now because we're going to go right now into the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for the trading block. All right, everybody, let's do it. Time for the old trading block. Time to talk about what's trading in the old markets today. Another day, another kind of, eh, what the heck's going to go on in the market? Let's, let's sell off, I guess, because why not day? There. Not a huge amount of news. A little bit of concern. China coming out with some numbers on the economic side. Not exactly robust, uh, shall we say, which uh, always spooks people. Maybe the impact of the trade war and the, the global economic malaise outside of the U.S. really may be going to be worse, more exacerbated than perhaps people thought. So that's all combining to weigh on the street today. Dow off about a quarter of a percent. The laggard today, which is interesting. S&P off not quite half a percent, almost though. And then NASDAQ off a little bit more than half a percent. All that red means uh, VIX cash taking a little bit of a lift up about a handle today. Or I won't even say percent of a percent, even though it is fun just to tweak the people out there who go so crazy with such things out there. Of course, all these sell-offs means we're, we're still away from these magical, mythical levels out there where we need to be to really... Uh, Bounce out of correction territory. I think it's twenty five eighty six on the S and P. You ain't hitting that today, at least not right now. Which is, which is probably uh, not a surprise to those out there listening. Also, looking here, other things weighing on the street today. Apple getting, you know, this is why we love analysts on this show. Apple getting a little bit of a smack back down to the one fifty level, courtesy of an analyst who came out and reiterated his price target of two hundred dollars. So. 50 handles north of where it is right now. Our listeners are roughly 30-odd percent. <laughs> then he also said in order to meet that price target, they have to aggressively cut prices in China to increase sales and have go on a significant M&A spree on the uh, content side of the space, neither of which they have done. Yet he still maintains his $200 price target. So that just shows shows the idiocy of the analyst space <laughs> pretty much in a nutshell right there. But I guess it worked because they got us talking about it a little bit. Not for the right reasons, but that's what analysts want at the end of the day. They want to get their stuff quoted and talked about. And I guess apparently this is working as Apple, again, off two handles or right around the 150 level. So those puts still doggedly struggling to maintain their in-the-money status. We shall see. Let's go back around the horn the other way. Let's start with the meatball, sir. A lot of weird things going on today and kind of a bit of a weird day. What's, uh, what's on your radar today, sir? Yeah, I think what's on my radar is what, what I would say is the lack of, of volatility at all. Um, you know, we, there's never really been a bid for any, vol, uh, any volatility as the day has, has worn on. Nobody seems to care. Nobody's afraid. Uh, the day looks like we're going to go right back to, you know, kind of where we closed on Friday, even though we're down. Um, the other piece, Citigroup, right? Had er- Citigroup had earnings this morning, and... The earnings stunk, and it's up over $2, of course. And all of the financials are up with it. Um, you know, Citi's up four per, over 4%. Uh, Goldman's up 1%. JP Morgan's up 1%. All of the financials are flying on reduced guidance. I guess the story is that as bad as guidance was – it was not as bad as the street was worried about, and that is why we saw the uh, – that's why I guess we saw um, the financials all running hotter. And really the only thing that's, that's down is some of these industrial names. Uh, Apple looks a little soft today, still holding 150. And Facebook is about to be – looks like it wants to run back to 150, which is kind of fascinating. Those fang names – they're uh, they're all moving kind of independently of each other, but I think we've got a decent decent odds of near red on the day in the VIX, and three days in a row of opening down almost one percent or more, and then crawling back throughout the day to near unched or up. Um, that's kind of the pattern that we've seen Thursday, then today, and then uh, on on uh, Friday. We all we've seen is open down rally. Open down rally, open down rally, and uh, you know I, I don't know when people are going to stop being so ecstatic about their overnight trade, about what's going on overnight. But it doesn't seem to there's a complete disconnect between 
the uh, the active market hours and, and what's going on in the overnight sessions right now. Uh, but you're right. We are kind of kicking it off again. It is that time. It seems like we just got finished with earnings season and we begin the dance yet again. So it is time to dance once again here. Earnings season. You're right. City uh, lighting it up as we speak, looking at the most actives out there in options land. Uh, City actually number three with 151,000. Number one, Bank of America, just crushing faces out there. Th- about 350,000 contracts on the tape. Almost their entire ADV right already on the tape already. Their ADV is about 413,000. Apple in the rear number two spot with only a quarter of a million, a paltry quarter of a million contracts on the tape. Their ADV, in case you're wondering, is about 626,000 contracts. Then City, they usually do 107, doing a buck 50 already today. GE number four, also right around a buck 50, pretty much a little bit less than half of their ADV. Then we got uh, PCG, and then we got Facebook coming in at number six with 120,000. Uh, AMD number seven and Micron number eight, those two neck and neck, both tied. At 113,000. Number nine, good old NVIDIA, 96,000. Run out the top 10. Baba. Got to have a Chinese name in there somewhere, right? 94,000 contracts out there. Also worth noting on the index side, you see uh, VIX putting up about 271,000, over a quarter million. Their ADV, 587,000. So not quite uh, half there, but getting on their way there. SPY doing about a little over a million contracts. So again, not an enormous start to the day, but decent volume. ADV out there is over 4 million right now, about 402 uh, SPX, about almost 400,000 contracts on the tape. Their ADV, just shy of 2 million. And the Qs with about 335,000 contracts on the tape. Their ADV, again, just shy of a million, about 932,000 contracts. Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, in the quiet tranquility of St. Charles, what has been lighting up your tape, sir? Well, <clears throat> a couple things. Uh, just to kind of add to what Mark was saying about the financials, I think that's definitely one of the hot stories today on the marketplace. Uh, but the other thing to point out with that is that just, uh, financials in general have gotten so down the last year. Uh, we've been doing the wheel trades on uh, XLF, and I've talked about this a little bit on the show in terms of how it's so depressed in value. At this stage, we're just holding on to it, waiting for it to come up a little bit more. Uh, until we're able to sell some covered calls on it again. But I think perhaps one of the reasons, uh, just to add to what Mark had said, uh, and that uh, the guidance wasn't as bad as what the street had thought, so uh, that's what's helping financials rally. I mean, the other thing is just that they've just got so beaten down um, over the course of the last <clears throat> uh, few, well, actually a few months, I should say. Uh, and I think that's another thing to add to it. Uh, second thing that I want to mention uh, in terms of what's going on with a lot of things um, just to add to what you had said at the beginning of the show with uh, all things crypto, I just want to again go on record to say that um, I, I'm changing my stance on crypto. I'm no longer thinking uh, it's going to I, I'm no longer super bearish uh, and the reason I'm no longer super bearish on, on uh, Bitcoin. Uh, so I should say Bitcoin because I don't follow all crypto, but just kind of looking at Bitcoin, I'm no longer super bearish on it. I'm just I, 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 I'm upgrading it to just bearish now just because it's come down so much. Uh, so I just want to reiterate my, my stance on that and uh, might not uh, please a lot of the uh, Bitcoin people out there, but uh, that's where I'm at with that. Um, the other thing, Apple, we are still treading around that 150 level. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see if it will go higher or lower from there, because it does seem to be, uh, if you are a bull on Apple, uh, it does seem to be kind of creating a, uh, a floor, so to speak, but we will see. Uh, it's going to be an interesting couple of weeks coming up with uh, not only the deal or no deal market, uh, the, the deal or no deal market with both China and uh, the government shutdown, as well as uh, earnings coming up. So uh, it's going to be a fun show over the course of the next couple of weeks. I like that. The deal or no deal market. Will you get a sweet new car or will you get a donkey? I guess we'll, <laughs> every day is a little bit of, of that game. What's behind door number three? Oh, no, it's a donkey yet again. And we're selling off. Uh, but you're right, you know, it is interesting stuff. Since we are touching on earnings season, quick preview here again. You can read the full write-up uh, from our friends over there at Orats. It's that time of the year again, so they're cranking away and crunching the numbers so you don't have to, all for free, which is quite generous of them, if I do say so myself. Again, look for the earnings move reports. Just type Orats, O-R-A-T-S, into the search bar on our website, and you'll get all these move reports. They're, they're already crunching the numbers 
for the financial segment here, looking at uh, the options, earnings, options report here. Let's start with J.P. Morgan. They're popping off tomorrow before the bell. Of course, ticker symbol J.P.M. Coming into the report time, they were hovering just shy of 100 bucks. Uh, they were pricing in 2.5 bucks. So that's pretty easy, right? 2.5%. The pass move is pretty much in line with that, about 240. So they're pretty much pricing things in line with those numbers. In terms of historical projected moves, that's, of course, the average of all moves pretty much since they have data. That's actually a lot less, a buck forty-six. So maybe they're pricing a little bit uh, more than recent moves. Again, you can go by past actual moves are a buck forty, which is in line with that. Same quarter moves are a buck fifty. So all sorts of data here you could parse. I'll let you guys who are trading these look it up for yourselves, but it's pretty interesting stuff. Wells Fargo also coming into this report time was around forty eight. They were pricing in a buck fifty. Their past expected moves have been around a buck fifty. So that's pretty much in that same time frame. The actual moves they've actually delivered in the past have been eighty eight cents which is an average, again, of all their kind of other moves. So a lot less, maybe, if you're looking at it from that perspective. Uh, also, Goldman coming up before the bell on the 16th. They are trading. They were trading by the time of this report right around 177. They're pricing in six bucks, so comparatively a little bit rich. They uh, past expected moves have been two and a half. Past actual moves average is about 366, and uh, same quarter moves about three and a quarter out there. So interesting how that looks uh, comparatively uh, on a first blush a little rich, but I have to do a little bit of digging in this one to see how that compares to uh, other cycles and other fun things like that. But again, now all that data up there for free right now at theoptionsider.com or head on over to orats.com and then search for this stuff. It could be available there as well. As we keep on rolling, let's keep rolling, yeah, into the odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. everybody welcome to the odd block the portion of the show where you like if you like to get wild like to get a little bit odd this is a segment for you okay let's kick things off we're going to actually look back a little bit before we look at today's numbers and today's trades actually going to look back to a trade we profiled back on december 6th here on the show so a little over a month and change ago it was looks like somebody uh loving themselves some puts for some size in SIG, which is Signet Jewelers Limited, ticker symbol SIG. Uh, at the time, we talked about paper looks like buying about 13000 12900 to be precise, for the old double price of $0.55. Cents. These things were about a quarter bid at 70 at the time, so it does seem fairly certain like this was uh, probably buying paper, also opening paper. So brand new paper going up there, and it seems like this trade in hindsight was fairly well-timed. Whoever had concerns about the downside there in SIG was spot on. The stock at the time of this trade on the 6th was $41. Uh, by the time these options expired, not too long later, only talking a few weeks later, right? The stock would hit 31 and a half, so almost 10 handles lower than where it was at the time of this trade. So these 35 puts were substantially in the money around expiration time to the order of several dollars, <laughs> about three and a half bucks. It looks like going into uh, expiration there. So you think, hey, home run, right? This guy did well. Yet you look at the positions going in on expiration day there in December and surprise, surprise, these puts were still open. 13,400 of these bad boys still open on that strike as of expiration and actually beyond. So they pretty much went out open went out for multiple dollars which is kind of weird now obviously we have a case here where probably our friend decided he actually wanted to take the stock at 35 which is odd again you know you, you do that you surrender all of your time value there wasn't a ton of time value left on these bad boys but still uh, it's an interesting choice mark i wanted to highlight this for a couple of reasons first off because you know it worked out so those are always worth Noting, Oft, sometimes these trades, the smart, the size money is the smart money. In this case, that was the case. Uh, but also weird that they didn't take them off the books. They actually used options 
for what they were pretty much designed for, which is sounds like uh, getting short some stock. Is that your take as well, sir? That's what it looks like. That's it, exactly what it looks like. Is there? How, I mean, uh, when you're out there at Carmen Line, is there a, is there a scenario where you where you let your puts expire in the money? I mean, there. Yes, that that there is that scenario. If you want to be short the physical, it could be that they want to. The other time I'll do that is when I'm. Um, so here is an example of um, a time that I did. I you'll you'll make fun of me for this. I did it a little differently, but I accidentally took delivery on some long calls. <laughs> accidentally. So, <laughs> I, I, I like that. So I, um, so I, I did it a little differently. I sold some deep in the money calls against them to wiping out the delta, and then just let the let the stock get called away from me. So it could be that the, that these were being used against a long position, and the person was looking to eliminate the entirety of their position. Did not want, uh, you know, was trying to take something off the books. So that would be why you'd let let. Uh, let a position expire in the money is you you have something to deliver and you want to get rid of it that would seem to be the case and you know obviously there is a hassle if you if you had the underlying and then of course you had to go into the process with other things so the put is there you have it you bought it you clearly have a use case for it so sometimes you let options be used for their intended use case which is to <laughs> give you the stock or let you sell the stock in this case and our friend here did so that's worthy of note we don't see that too often here on the odd block where uh, the options kind of go out the way they were intended. Uh, so interesting stuff, well-timed paper, and also interesting use case there at the end. Let's see if our second friend also fared as well. We're going to go now back a month from that to November 5th uh, to some line-in-the-sand puts we profiled in TransUnion, ticker symbol TRUE. What we hope profiled back on November 5th were the D60 puts, looks like our good old Good old line in the sand type puts about fourteen thousand of those paper crushing in actually below the bid aggressively above the bid. These things were seventy five cent bid. He got fourteen thousand off at sixty cents. So uh, maybe he had to he had to be a little aggressive to get fourteen thousand off in this name. There's certainly possible. Could also be a late print, even though it's not lit, marked late. So yeah, aggressive aggressive sale on these bad boys. I'm guessing true, not the deepest name. So they do fourteen thousand. That uh, seventy-five cent bid is not good for fourteen thousand listeners. So our friend here discovering that perhaps the hard way. Uh, so he'd drawn that line in the sand pretty aggressively fourteen thousand times uh, at the D sixty put line, and the that line was crossed. That line was crossed uh, again fairly aggressively here. So he drew that line in the sand pretty aggressively at 50, excuse me sixty bucks, and the stock going out to expiration was pretty much fifty three. 30 so aggressively quite close to seven handles in the money on these bad boys uh but it looks like interestingly enough uh, our friend maybe decided discretion was the better part of value you say this all the time you have a trade is you know if it goes your way and it's you it's it's a long trade it goes your way take it off and if it's going against you maybe have some risk pro- management profile in there seems like that's what our friend did here because these things expired obviously Third Friday in December, but a week before that, pretty much about a little bit more. Actually, looks like right on the close to the same time we talked about our last trade about a week later on the 14th. So getting close to expiration there in December, our friend came in and decided again discretion the better part of valor. Stock selling off, he decided to take them off at least a good chunk of them, including a big block of 7,500 or so for a buck oh five. Other blocks of 500 or so for 90 cents and 70 cents. So they weren't all terribly in his face but that a good chunk at least half of them were taken off for about a 40 cent loser so he took his lumps on this trade i don't i have to add up where all the different blocks of 200 and two at different prices how that nets out looks like he closed them out let's just assume somewhere around the 90 odd cent level so looks like a nice 30 cent hit fourteen thousand times uh you guys do the math that one could hurt a little bit but he decided to his credit You know, this one was going against him. He decided to close it out. Open interest going into expiration was pretty much, uh, actually coming out of expiration, was about 1,300 contracts. So he closed this bad boy out. So that's what happens. You know, sometimes, listeners, you draw that line in the sand. Maybe you're doing it. This guy clearly really just wanted to harvest the 60 cents. He didn't want to buy himself some true at 59.40. That was not his intention because he had that opportunity and he decided not to take it. Uh, So uh, clearly he decided, again, in this case, discretion, the better part of valor, take his lumps 
As we're looking right now, it seems like that was a pretty decent trade. True right now at 56 even out there, so still well below. By the way, when he closed them out, the stock was almost 59, 58.95. So three handles north of where it is right now. So looks like that was a good trade in retrospect. Uh, Mr. Meatball, this one, we kind of have to laud this. I mean, it didn't go his way, but he, he took his lumps and he got out. Is that, is that your preferred course of action in this scenario, sir? You know, yes. When, you, when you've been beat, take, you, know, you, you just get out. Uh, but again, we don't know what the other side of his trade was, so... Uh, it might not be nearly as lumpy as as it sounds. Oh, I know. I know all things, sir. And it was lumpy, let me tell you. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) I'm just kidding. We don't know, of course. But it is fun to speculate sometimes. But yeah, this one, at least on the option side, a little bit of risk management going a long way to maybe save this guy a little bit of action. Took his pain, but not perhaps as much as he would have taken if he hadn't done so. Let's let's round it out here with a trade that came across our radar today. Again, kind of a quiet day. Not a lot of big prints going up or especially exotic prints, one that caught our eye of Sauron today, came in Key Corp. This is ticker symbol Key. This stock right now trading about 16 and a quarter, up roughly 2% on the day. So a little bit of green on the screen today and otherwise a lot of red out there. This is a bank holding corp, in case you're wondering, Key Bank and a bunch of others out there. And what we saw out here looks like uh, looks like a bit of a late, kind of out of sequence bit attempt to maybe harvest a little bit of the old premium. It was almost a little over 9,000, 9,200 of the Jan expiring on the 25th, so not your monthlies and the weeklies there. 16 half calls going up aggressively through the bid, again, about 9,000 times and change for 24 cents. These things were 29 cent bid at 32 going out. But again, listeners, those displayed markets may be good for 50 up if you're lucky. Beyond that, you got to do some size. You got to go, to move a little bit. Uh, that's an argument people have with. With the displayed quotes right now, liquidity out there. The quotes, even if they look tight, they can't get size off. And clearly our friend had to go a little bit beyond, a little bit below that to get about a nickel below that to get his 9,000 and change done. But he got it done. And it looks like our friend here wants to harvest himself pretty much a little bit of premium or dump his stock at around close to 1675, which is about a half a handle away here. Not too far away given today's move here. Uh, let's go back and look at a chart of uh, a good old key about a year a year ago it was trading 21 and change 2132 and it kind of vacillated around over that time it got as high as 2240 and as low on the downside right looks like in mid-december when all the kind of the madness was happening right around 1380 1366 actually was the low so bouncing a little bit off that about three handles north of that low since then but not quite up to the higher end of that range. Mr. Meatball, you got a stock that's vacillating around, doesn't do a lot of paper. Guy crushes through the bid to get these calls done nearly 10,000 times. Doing all this for a whopping 24 cents. Think he wants to just dump himself some stock? What's your take on this one, sir? Yeah, it's some sort of income play. Maybe not a stock in particular, but definitely looking to just get some premium out of, of a position that's been fluctuating but not really going anywhere. And I know you don't play in the individual equities. You play more in the indices yeah, and the big stops. Stuff, yeah. I mean, how often, yeah, how often do you have to go a nickel through the bid to get something done for decent size? Never. I guess you're not trading Key Corp then. Yeah, out there in VIX no, and those. I, I never. I mean, I, 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 in fact, I never pay the offer ever. Yeah, out there in products like VIX and the indices, you have a little bit of an advantage in that the posted size is actually good for some size. <laughs> so, yeah, yes. and, and, you can, mean it. and you can usually get stuff done in between them. So a little bit different trading, let's say, an SPX or a VIX versus Key Corp. But uh, still, interesting stuff. There shows them as the steps you have to do to get uh, done. This was also done late as well, so that could also account for some of the, uh, some of the mispricing there as well. Uh, okay, let's keep on rolling, though. It's Monday. You guys have come to expect a little bit of strategery. He's been delivering of late. Let's see if he can keep it up as we keep on rolling into our Monday strategy block. It's time to dispense options, wit, wisdom, and education. It's time for The Strategy Block. Uncle Mike, sir, you've been strategizing a lot lately to kick off the new year and wrap up last year. You think you got one more in you for a little bit, sir, before you take a break? I think I can pull it off. Are we ready? I think we are ready. Go for it, sir. All right. So what I want to talk about today, let's say that you have a portfolio of covered call stocks. 
uh, that you're looking at, perhaps wheel stocks. I want to go through some things that we're doing right now in our triple income strategy just to kind of give you an idea of our, our, our thoughts uh, on what to do when uh, you're in stocks and they're depressed in value and you can't really sell a covered call at the levels with which you had your basis on. Just a couple of ideas for it. Uh, the first one uh, would be that uh, you can do nothing. And for some of our stocks, that's what we're doing right now. We're just holding on to them in that uh, we're, we're letting them not be covered call stocks for the time being because we believe the stocks are depressed enough in value uh, to where we can hold on to them on the triple income strategy. Of course, we're still collecting a dividend on them for the time being, and we're waiting. Uh, being, as a wise man once said, sometimes patience is the better part of valor. And so that's what we are doing with some of the stocks that we have in our portfolio at this point in time. The thing to, to remind everyone of at this stage is nothing is ever perfect. There's no strategy that is always going to beat the market. There's no strategy that's always going to give you a certain thing. You have to be able to adapt. And right now, it's kind of tough for covered call traders in that if you're in a stock and the stock's gone down in value, then you don't. there's a lot of people that are probably having uncertainty right now. And I can just tell you from being in the business close to around 15 years uh, that times like this, I often get questions on what to do uh, with covered call strategies and covered call portfolios. So the first one is that you can wait and you can do nothing. Now, the second thing that you can take a look into doing is let's say that you have uh, 20 stocks in your covered call portfolio, and you could use any number. I'm just making up 20 just for the sake of making up a number. Perhaps what you can do is do an analysis of your stocks to where, number one, if you feel that any stocks are broken, meaning that they're go that you've turned bearish on or that you uh, don't think will work for you anymore, get rid of them. Uh, but if you are still liking stocks and, and they're just down in value a little bit, uh, then those may be stocks that just hold on to and do nothing. But then let's say there's other stocks that you have the same sentiment on, but maybe you're a little bit longer term in terms of when you think the stock's going to come back, then maybe it's time to sell some out-of-the-money covered calls on those stocks in that you're getting a little bit of income, not exactly what you wanted, but you are getting a little bit of income. Uh, and the other benefit about the market where it's at right now is that volatility is higher. You can still sell some out-of-the-money covered calls and still get some decent income for it uh, in a lot of stocks. So it's another thing to think of is selling covered calls on a portion of your covered call portfolio, but not all of them. Because if the market does rally back rather quickly, then you'll still get to be a part of it and still get a lot of your equity back from the stocks you left open. Uh, or, or, And with that being said, uh, what you can also do is collect a little bit of income in the meantime, so that way in case the rally doesn't come and the markets don't come back, you have the income. Now, the final thing I talk about very frequently, and this is one that I've become more of a fan of over the course of the last five, six years of my trading career, and that's selling a call spread. On those stocks that I mentioned that maybe you're looking at and you feel that you still like them, but you want to collect some income from them in so of some sort, and you're really not as bullish as you were, meaning you think that uh, they're not going to come raging back anytime soon, but you still could see them coming back at some point. And if they do, for some reason, you're wrong. And you want to be a part of the rally, should it come raging back, then buy some junk. Well, what I mean by that is, is you can still sell an out-of-the-money covered call, but buy another call on top of it. You're still collecting income. You're still getting all the principles and all the joys and wonders of a covered call. The only difference is you're not getting quite as much premium. Now, what's the benefit of that? Should this market come raging back, then you can still be a part of it. The only thing that you will have missed out on is the section of the stock that you missed the rally on. So in other words, let's say XYZ stock is at 50 and you were to sell a 55-60 call spread and the stock was at 70, well, you could still be a part of it if it rallied back to 70 or even a little bit higher to 75. All you would do is miss out between 55 and 60. So that's another thing with which to think about. Uh, so if you are a premium seller and you're doing it unlevered, meaning you're selling covered calls or cash secured puts, these are some things to think about when you're in a market like this to where you're just not quite sure what to do. Now, once again, make sure that you're managing risk in the best possible way and that you're allocated well for your own 
overall financial goals and objectives. And that is the latest strategy block. Well said, sir. All right. We've got some time. Let's keep on rolling into a special extra sweet Monday edition of the mail block. It's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for the mail block. All right, everybody. Welcome to the mail block, the portion of the show where you guys take the reins, questions, comments, insights, all that goodness. Uh, you know where to find us at options, questions at the options insider.com, our website feedback form, and so on and so forth. Uh, let's see here. Let's pay off some stuff we've asked you guys recently, including uh, our big Apple. Looks like those that strike back in favor yet again, a 150 put dance. Going on. We could ask that question again, but uh, we have a different one in store for you this week. But uh, we asked you guys last week, <coughs> excuse me, the 150 puts in Apple. Everyone sold for two bucks. We're pretty much in the money. They're kind of right at the money again right now. What do you guys want to do? Uh, did you want to keep the stock for around 148? So let the puts expire and get the stock put to you. Uh, then get, of course, once you do that, do you want to turn around and have the covered, sell covered calls against it to wheel out? So that implies you're going to take the stock first, just in case those of you who were cons- confused. By that level, there wheeling out implies an expiration first to get the stock. Uh, do you want to roll the puts down, or do you want to just close the whole thing out? And it was a, a tight race, very tight race, which surprised me for Apple. Usually, there's a lot more unanimity of opinion out there on popular names like this, or maybe there's two two choices that people are everyone's fighting over. But now, in this case, all four were pretty much pretty equidistant. Ended up closing the position wins with 28 percent, which surprises me. It means that some of you think maybe there's a a little bit more red on the screen for Apple before it turns green again, which is interesting. So maybe the bull's taking a bit of a back seat. Hot on his heels, 27% saying you're going to happily buy Apple at the 148 level, which right now looks like a decent buy. Uh, 26% saying you're going to roll that put down. Remember, I said it was close, listeners. So you, you think you want it, you don't mind taking the stock, but maybe you want to roll it down a little bit. Take your lumps first uh, because uh, you think it's going to be a little bit more downside in the near term, and then maybe if that second strike gets hit, maybe. You take the stock or maybe you roll it again. Who knows? Uh, we didn't get that far in our poll. And then 19% at the end there coming out with wheeling out a covered call. This week we asked you, uh, just went live like a little bit ago, so it just uh, we haven't really had a chance to compile any votes. But we asked you, keep things simple. You know, a lot of names getting beaten down this week, getting taken a drubbing. We talked about a few of them here on the show. Uh, let's look out a little bit. Let's look out beyond Jan, because that's just a couple of weeks. Let's look out to Feb expiration. How about that? Give you a, a month and change to get your thoughts together. Which of these four different names would you rather buy your proverbial 5% out of the money call on? We didn't want to just say out of the money call because people like specificity. So there you go. 5% out of the money call. Give you four choices, four popular choices. VIX, Apple, SPY, or Amazon. So quite frankly, which one do you think has the best chance of doing a nice little 5% retracement there in the near term? Uh, people are already starting to hit this one up. Early voting is interesting. Uh, let's go out to Mr. Meatball. First off, if you have a vote, which one would you rather buy a pure? We didn't get crazy. No verticals. No bullish risk reversals. Just a straight up 5% out of the money call. Which of these four would you rather pick one on, sir? And most importantly, mm. what do you think our audience is picking? I... Would rather let me the five percent right the, so not VIX because it looks bulletproof. Uh, Amazon and Apple have earnings coming up, so it, are those would be probably the more you know a five percent move between now and Feb in in Spy, especially after we've already had that that type of move, maybe a little less likely. Um. I don't like, you know, VIX almost never rallies once earnings season is done. So now the question is just Apple and Amazon, uh, you know, which would I rather have uh, an out-of-the-money call on right now? Uh, You know, you do have the crazy, ridiculous Amazon love, so maybe that. But Apple is so unloved that maybe that could, they could actually really surprise people uh, come, uh, come earnings season. So... It's kind of a coin flip between those two. Let me let me just double check when earnings are for these ones. Apple is uh, the January January twenty ninth. Amazon is January thirty first. So, but you know, five percent for Amazon, you're talking eighty dollars 
five percent for Apple. You're talking what seven and a half dollars? Uh, I, I, I feels like Apple could make that move easier than than Amazon. So I'm going to say five percent out of the money Apple, and I'm going to say that that Amazon is winning. Interesting, interesting analysis, sir. Uncle Mike, was that sir. A, but did I spend way too long to no, make? The, no, no, I, I, I like that. that. That's actually good because it just went live. It give, give people more time to vote. Uh, Mister Uncle Mike, sir, do you agree with that analysis, or do, would you slap him in the face with your proverbial glove right now if you could? Oh, I would never do such a thing to Mark with my proverbial glove. Uh, no, I think that uh, I would agree on the VIX. Uh, if I had to pick one, uh, the first thing I want to mention is that I, I probably wouldn't put uh, the risk like that into an individual stock. But if uh, I'm just taking a flyer and uh, just hanging out with all, with my good friends, you guys, and the listener listening audience, uh, I think I would probably like to have see Amazon even over Apple at this point. Because uh, Apple, it's, it appears it's going to be um, flattening out a little bit. And Amazon, I think there's uh, going to be more crazy love with Amazon in the near term, uh, just because I think all the, the crazy love that comes to Apple, uh, it's already still in Apple, having not sold Apple, whereas I could see more crazy love coming into Amazon. So I'm going to go with Amazon, and I think the audience said that as well. Yeah, you know, I'm kind of uh, I'm kind of torn between I think those two probably as well. I don't want to give my I don't want to weigh in because I don't I just start. I don't want to color people's votes yet. I'll, I'll weigh in at the end there. But uh, yeah, it's interesting to watch. Though I, those, if I had to have my druthers, I, I'm kind of vacillating between those two in my head right now as well. Our audience is kind of vacillating as well. It started off again. It just went live a little bit while ago, and uh, everyone was all love and spy. And then they started piling into Vix. And they started piling into app. Right now, it's uh, actually Vix leading the dance with 33%, 27% now for Spy, and a tie for third with 20% each for Apple and Amazon. But again, this is early days. Get on over to Ad Options, make your voice heard. Uh, we'll discuss it later in the week when it's got a little bit more time under its belt. All right. Uh, let's see here. What do we got? What do we got? Um, AB41S. That's just a, that's just a mouthful there. He or she writing is long put slash long stock or indeed futures. Uh, is that does that seem to be the way to be? <laughs> Let me read that again. Seems to be the way to be. That's a that's a mouthful of a sentence as well. Seems to be the way to be in this market. So AB forty one S long put long stock. He wants to be long a call in this market. Maybe he he should be voting in our poll right now. We just gave him a chance to do just that. I don't know, Uncle Mike. Are you um? Are you a fan of just straight up long puts in stock in this market, sir? No. Um, <laughs> Ooh, look at you, our fan. bull, our bull, our resident bull, saying nay. No, I think that uh, just long put, long stock. I, I think that's kind of tough to do at this point. I think that uh, the way with which to go with it in this marketplace, I think you need to spread it off in some way, shape, or form. And uh, whether it would be instead of just long put, long stock. Um, I think the way to go in this marketplace would be along the lines of doing some type of spread, maybe selling a call spread against the long put long stock, uh, maybe even selling some type of uh, premium below the long put, whether it's a put spread, whether it's a short put, depending on what your risk tolerance is. Uh, I think that uh, doing a single leg option, meaning uh, just straight up buying premium without any way of spreading it off, uh, I think it's a little bit pricey for my taste in this market right now. Yeah, those puts got some juice built into them. So you're not averse to the core position. You want to just add some kickers to uh, to finance it, shall we say? In the old, in the to use the old British vernacular, Mister Mike, or Mister 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 Meatball, <laughs> are you uh, are you also taking a dim view on puts in stock right now, sir? Oh, are you pulling a rock lobster on me? Have you muted yourself, sir? I did mute myself. I, I look at me trying to be responsible. Normally, normally, for those of you that don't know, here's a little peek behind the. Uh, peek behind the curtain that generally speaking in a given podcast mark hangs up on me what three what's the over under on number of times you're going to hang up at least on me? three give it a three three all right and and uh the reason being that i forget to mute and i've got something going on in the background or valentino's crying or lauren's asking me something or you're getting those good bees Alicia at Costco. Or, or somebody and uh Today and so I've gotten the habit of uh, of actually muting myself, which is uh, you know sounds crazy, but th- there's the trade. Um, so back to uh, puts in stock. Um, the only reason to really use puts in stock is 
as a you know you already have the stock and you're using puts to augment the the downside it, it's not i don't like them as a combo i'd rather just buy a call unless you're you know i'll see them with some sort of weird dividend play but that but that's really about it yeah, obviously we don't have the specifics on this uh, AB forty one S's positions. Maybe you can't sell your stock for whatever reasons. Maybe maybe the puts are helping you give a little bit of shield to that as a result. So maybe a little more details might help. But in general, going out right now and just establishing puts and stock, maybe there are better ways. It's, we have a related question here. For a lot of people, have puts and stock on their brain right now. Go figure why that might be. Uh, and <laughs> also have mouthful mouthful handles. <laughs> And and E N T R three S again, just just great handles here. Uh, does it make sense to load up? He wants to go the other way. Does it make sense to load up on extra puts against stock these days to get extra short deltas against a big correction? So the other guy wanted to just be long put and long stock. This guy wants to be long stock and maybe long three puts because he's extra concerned. About well, that's that's probably a, a whole bunch of questions are, are wrapped in that. For example, why do you think that way? If you're that concerned about, maybe you might want to think about maybe liquidating some of your stocks or going some other ways. We talked about here before having some other kickers in there rather than just loading up on a ton of puts for kind of some of the reasons we we described before. Those puts are not exactly cheap right now, uh, so you're paying to get that. And then on top of that, you know, it's just straight up long premium that can decay. You know, maybe. Maybe do some of the ways we kind of just outlined. Maybe put spreads instead of just puts. Uh, so that way, maybe if you have a defined range in your brain, if I'm worried about the S&P selling off between this range and this range in the near term, maybe you do a spread around that range. So therefore, you make some of your you – don't, you don't just shell out a ton of money for a bunch of extra premium and to get ton, short a ton of deltas just on the concern. But yeah, I don't know. In general, this guy is, is looking to get extra short deltas. I don't, Uncle Mike, if, if a client calls you up and says, hey, I need to get – Short a bunch of deltas here. Would you? Would you? Would you even want to hold on to his underlying? Would you maybe think he wants to get out of that at that point? Yeah, I would think he'd probably want to get out of it at that point, unless you're trying to do something to where you're doing uh, an unleveraged straddle of play of some sort. Then I'm typically. Not my thing. And I know one thing that and I'm not talking about the way with which I know Andrew does some hedging in that he will, and I'm oversimplifying this a little bit, he'll buy 100 shares of stock and he will buy two out of the money puts. And if the stock goes down, he'll sell one of them. And he has a strategy in terms of how he'll do it as kind of a dynamic hedge. I'm not talking about that. But if you want to uh, create more deltas than you own stock, then I think you're just better off not being in the stock, quite frankly. So, uh, and then doing some type of a bearish play that way, if you want to do it. Uh, so the only time I would consider doing something like that is if you're doing a dynamic hedge, like Andrew likes to talk about, uh, to where he is, as Andrew puts it, doing stuff, uh, and hedging very dynamically along those lines. Uh, or if you're trying, if you have some type of, uh, unleveraged straddle play and by an unlevered straddle, if you, uh, we're to buy 100 shares of an underlying and buy two at the money puts. Uh, a lot of times you're going to come out delta neutral. And if you have some type of, you, and which is the same as a straddle, uh, then if you have some type of play like that where you don't want to be levered in any way, then that might be a consider something to consider. Uh, but unless it's one of those two things, I probably would not be in it. Mr. Meatball, we just talk in puts, one put and stock. Now we're talking multiple puts and stock. Do you have a similar dismissive view of it, sir? Well, all right, so here's the scenario where I could see something like that making a little sense is you're you're looking at um, you know Im- implied volatility levels that are especially low and a stock that is especially high. So think about a stock where you're at multi-year highs and its implied volatility is at multi-year lows. So you're you're getting a lot more bang for your buck doing something like that as a value play. Um, on on a, uh, a stock position, so cutting your delta down when it's the absolute cheapest to cut down cut down delta um, maybe makes some sense. So, you know, for instance, imagine a stock's normal implied volatility is twenty, and buying a five percent out of the money put would cost you normally a dollar. If implied volatility is low enough that I can then buy a put for let's say 60 cents or 
or 70 cents, well, then I might be willing to load up on more puts at, at that level because that implied volatility is, is giving me value in, in the hedge. That would be a scenario where where something like that would, would make sense to me. But other than that, it, it is not something I would, I would generally go for. Interesting stuff. Again, a little more details can help us give you a little bit more nuanced idea of what's going on here. Speaking of nuanced ideas, we're talking straddles. Uncle Mike Rip Torn here says he's working on the technical indicator of beta for a straddle placement strategy. Okay. Good luck to you, sir. Let us know when you have, again, more details on that would be helpful as well. What you're thinking. It sounds like you're trying to work out where to, where to have a, a good indicator for strike selection for straddles. Uh, again, not a use case we see too often. I'd be curious to see what you come up with, a different use case for beta <laughs> than we typically uh, see out there. Maybe you find a name that lines up better, correlates better with a, a sector you like, and then you go use straddles as a result. Again, I'm, I'm kind of interpolating from a couple of lines here. So let us know more when you have more. Speaking of which, we're going to keep on rolling. We have a little more for you. It's time to go around the block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, everybody. Around the Block time means it's time to go around the earnings block again. Yes, it's that time again. Listeners, new year, new cycle to kick it all off. I kind of highlighted some of the financials. Uh, We have, of course, City today, tomorrow, Tuesday. We have J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo. If you don't like those, you prefer airlines, you got United and Delta popping off tomorrow as well. Men's Day, you got some more financials. You got Bank of America, Goldman, BlackRock, PNC, BNY Mellon, U.S. Bank Corp. Also got the old stalwart of Alcoa. Used to be the kind of name that kicked it all off. Now some names have superseded it out there. Thursday, we got more financials. Morgan Stanley, uh, American Express, and some name, I don't know, you may have heard of Netflix. Flicks, I think is how it's pronounced. So, yeah, some names popping off this week you may want to pay attention to. Stay glued to the Options Insider and our Twitter feed. We'll have all those earnings move reports coming out for you. We will crank out what's expected as well as what uh, how it actually played out in the marketplace. Again, this data used to be unavailable or extremely expensive to get. You're getting it for free now, so you can't really complain. Pretty good deal. Uh, TheOptionsInsider.com, the place to go. For all of that goodness, Uh, let's go around the horn. We talked about earnings. There's other macro trends on the horizon as well, obviously. Let's go. Let's start the other way. Let's go. Uncle Mike, sir, what are you watching for the rest of the week? Well, of course, the earnings announcements want to see how that reacts to everything. Uh, And in particular, the financials, as we had mentioned earlier on the show, uh, continuing to watch the macro events. And then I want to see if we can get uh, out of correction territory uh, with this marketplace. That's what I'm eyeballing. And then. Uh, like I said, there's there's a lot of things that we're looking at over the course of the next couple of weeks. And uh, I'm going to be watching the option block because uh, we're going to be talking about a lot of good stuff these next few weeks. Oh, watching him. Does that mean you're going to be in studio staring at me, sir, face to face? Um, correction, listening. <laughs> there you go. You like you like the meatball putting in his spy cameras everywhere to keep an eye on me. I know what you guys are up to. Uh, yeah, you're right. We are kind of people are looking at these uh, correction levels. Not so much today in terms of we're selling off a bit now, but uh, we're, well, the sell off does seem to be ameliorating though. We need to hit twenty three nine seventy one in the Dow and twenty five eighty six twenty one in the S and P to come out of that technical ten percent correction level. So uh, keep an eye on those, like I'm sure Uncle Mike will be. Uh, Mister Meatball, same question for you, sir. What are you watching? Keep an eye on for the rest of this week until we gather together here again on Thursday. You know, I think from a market-wide perspective, I don't know that Netflix is, you know, everybody loves Netflix because it's a hot and interesting name, but I think these bank earnings and these airline earnings are going to be a lot more important to how earnings season plays out than anything Netflix is going to have to say. Um, and, uh, you know, Netflix could, should be a fun, I'll be interested to see what they have to say on the earnings call about the what's going to happen with that Disney content. And I actually think that's actually, again, kind of the most important piece of the Netflix Earnings, you know, how are they going to manage content going forward? Losing um, Marvel, Star Wars, Disney, Pixar, and Fox. All right, everybody. That music means, unfortunately, our journey through the world of options has come to an end. But never fear, the network always has you covered in between episodes here. 
of the old option block. So, yeah, we have uh, interviews hitting the network all the time. We had boot camp coming back. You guys love that. You got boot camp last week. How fun was that? Check that out if you haven't already. Bringing a little education back with a vengeance for you out there. We also got, like I mentioned, the new crypto rundown coming at you later today. So you guys just have an embarrassment of riches, especially for the price you're paying, which is free. (laughs) So (laughs) glad you guys are enjoying it out there. We're going to keep the content palooza coming at you. Speaking of content paloozas, Uncle Mike, if I go to St. Charles and I click on the Fox, any, any good content coming my way, sir? What can I expect? Uh, nothing from clicking on the Fox, but if you click on my email address or my phone number in some way, shape, or form, feel free to contact me. Uh, if you want to go down an epic sojourn, as Mark would say, uh, however, in the world of personal finance, please contact me. Uh, I'm one of the few financial advisors on the planet that uh, is uh, one who incorporates options into my uh, mainstay of my portfolio strategies. I uh, would love to work with you. Check out my website, get my contact info, and uh, give me a call or shoot me an email. There you go, listeners. Click on the fox. If we all do it enough times, he'll eventually have to put something cool there. So let's make him do it collectively. Let's say Uncle Mike. Send him an email to say, click on the fox, and he'll do it. And Mr. Meatball, if I want to go maybe check out this new cool thing I hear about called Edge Hunter, where should I go? What should I do, sir? Yeah, well, we we just launched our new um, option scanning software that's in conjunction with uh, Sivo LiveVol, uh, and you know we're we're still uh, creating the Edge Hunter website. But if you go to option.com/slash/edgehunter, you can find uh, you can find everything you need to know about our new awesome Edge Hunter product. Uh, you can also just email me marketoption.com, and I'll be happy to talk to you about all the great uh, scanning stuff that we have now. The important thing to listen is if you ask them about it, you have to say it like this, Edge Hunter. That's how you say it. it so indeed. That's sure. right. I'm gonna have, I might have to get you to do uh, like the recording so, <laughs> like for uh, introducing the product when we do some sort of overview. Know, my VO rates, they're, they're pretty pricey, sir. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll negotiate that uh, <laughs> off the show here. All right. Check it out, though. Edge Hunter to learn more. And on behalf of the Greasy Meatball and Uncle Mike and indeed myself, I well, thank you all for downloading, streaming, subscribing, voting. You guys have already, uh, looks like VIX is still running away with it right now. 33% getting the VIX love out there. Get on over there, add options if you disagree with such things. You want to make your voice heard. That's the place to do it. In the meantime, we'll see you back here on Thursday for more of the option block. Maybe some more stuff in between, including if you got a little crypto in you, come back 4 p.m. Central, 5 p.m. Eastern. I know it's a little bit late. I get you. But, you know, again... A little bit different audience for this one, which is kind of fun as well. To join us live for the Crypto Rundown. Crazy week last week. Some fun stuff to run down. Otherwise, you'll get it on your podcast provider of choice. So stay tuned for that. And we'll see you back here, hopefully, tonight for the Crypto Rundown. Otherwise, we'll see you back on Thursday for more of the Option Block. The Options Insider Radio Network is sponsored by Fidelity Investments. Fidelity's Option Trade Builder tool can help you confidently build an options trade in three simple steps. Just choose a strategy, select a contract, and then review the benefits and risks of the trade. Learn more about Option Trade Builder at fidelity.com backslash options. Options trading entails significant risk and is not appropriate for all investors. Certain complex option strategies carry additional risk. Before trading options, contact Fidelity Investments by calling 800-544-5115 to receive a copy of the characteristics and risks of standardized options. Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC, member NYSC SIPC.